Thank you for joining me in Philippians chapter 2, and we'll read together verses 12 through 15. Do you see it? There you go. Join me. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. I'll probably finish this message with this statement, but I'm going to also begin it. The world is not listening to us. They are watching us. Father, teach us a great lesson this morning. And for every person here, that is something unique. But I pray that we will be sensitive enough to hear it. And when we hear it, receive it. And then obey it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Before you're seated, wave to Lake Park. Wave to Union Road. Wave to Wilmington. Wave to the Lord. Wave to your neighbor and smile on the way down. I'm always freshly amazed at the way the Holy Spirit tutored Paul the Apostle to write letters to the churches. It never ceases to make me marvel that he always begins talking about the greatness of God. The eternal knowledge of God, the foreknowledge, the, the choosing of God from eternity past. The gift of God, His Son Jesus, who bore our sins, took our sins, paid for our sins, forgave our sins, and then declared us to be one of His children. All of that majestic revelation at the beginning. He first tells us who God is. Then he says who we are because of God in Christ. And then he tells us how to live. It's not the opposite. He doesn't say live this way and then you'll know who God is. Do this and then you'll have God's peace. It's always God first. God makes the move. God moves towards us. God rescues us. It's very important that I begin this message today. This, I know you're looking for a New Year's message, aren't you? Okay. Well, it's very important that I begin this New Year's message by once again reiterating that what he did on the cross was so marvelous and what he gave to us when he rose from the dead, so inexplic inexplicably wonderful that we will never truly understand it. I love Isaiah 53, verse 6. God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Listen to me. You who still struggle with the assurance of your salvation. You who... One day feel saved and another day wonder if you've ever known the Lord. Listen, if he put it on Jesus, it's no longer on you. If Jesus bore our sins, we no longer bear them. He no longer takes sins and then gives them back. If he paid the price, it is paid for in full 
for eternity. Therefore, faith in Christ, just faith, is the greatest revelation we've had. Faith, the simple trust in God, gets your sins forgiven, guarantees eternal life. It reveals the goodness of God to you every day. Just faith. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He shall direct your path. It's as simple as that. There's nothing more to add to it. That's what churches do. They add to it. That's what denominations do. They add to it. I'm not going to get into that this morning. But I will say again, religion is the worst thing man has ever done to God. It's like the story I heard. I don't remember where I heard it. Or Here we go. Fred in his own talking now. <laughs> a farmer one time had a bad gait. He decided to hire a carpenter. And while he was talking to the carpenter about building him a new gate, he tried to tell him about Jesus and that just simple faith in Jesus was all that it took to be reconciled to God. And the carpenter kept arguing and saying, well, there's, there's more I have to do. I've got to fix this. I have to straighten up. It's not just faith. And so they agreed on a price. They forgot the conversation. Uh, a couple of weeks later, the carpenter comes back with the new gate to be hung. He hangs it for the farmer to see. The farmer takes an axe and begins to chop it and chip it and beat it. And the carpenter said, what are you doing? It was just right the way I had it. He said, no, I think I need to take this out and put this in. He said, you can't do that. You're ruining a completed gate. He said, that's exactly what you do when you try to add to what Christ has already finished and completed for you. So I'm talking to religious people this morning. Those of you that think you can't get to heaven unless you work harder and pray longer... Yeah, you missed it. You're chipping on a perfect gate. God has already given you eternal life. God has already perfected you in Christ Jesus. There's nothing you can add to it except believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. And as beautiful as that is, the gospel is never left up there. It's never in the clouds. It's never some ephemeral, hazy, phasy, foggy idea. Christianity is a practical lifestyle. And we tend to try to make it super natural, super spiritual. Folks, here's the bottom line. Not everybody that gets prayed for gets healed. Nobody wants to really deal with that, a lot of you, because in your mind, you reject and deny anything except what you want. And we have never really been able to come to the conclusion that God knows what He's doing and God has a plan for everybody. Not everybody that gets prayed for gets healed. Bad things happen to really good people. We are going to have funerals in this church this year. Things beyond description are going to happen, and we're going to say, why, Lord? This was a good person. Lord, what? it's going to happen because we have, over the years, tried our best to elevate a very practical, powerful, eternal life into something that is way up there. We live in a state of denial and we expect God to do everything we ask Him to do exactly the way we ask Him to do it and on time. So here's my New Year's message for you today. It's not going to happen. But I'm still going to serve the Lord. Whether He answers this prayer or not, I'm going to serve the Lord. We've got reports this week of choir members who they, they've discovered tumors in the throat. 
You'll say, why? Who knows why? Because we're not in heaven yet. We're not home yet. Things are going to happen to every one of us. Being saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues four or five hours a day and memorizing Scripture will not keep you from the tragedies of life. You're going to have to learn that this is a war and we are fighting a battle. This is life. This is real stuff. This is down to earth. You can't confess it away. You can't listen to motivational speakers who get you to dip your head under and, realize, and, and think that nothing ever except what you want is going to happen. In fact, folks, let me just tell you right now, the church is in a plague and, and it shouldn't be this way. For years and years, we've listened to even preachers, preachers tell people to dream big. And we've dreamed so big that we've lived out there rather than right here. Okay. Dream big. Go for it. Do what you've always wanted to do. And most people don't know what they want to do. They just know they don't want to be here doing this. And what happens? People who aren't satisfied in Christ. People who aren't fulfilled in Jesus will quit their jobs with family to feed and bills to pay and try to live the dream. They pursue it. It's what I've always wanted. Now I know three weeks ago I told you this little story but I'm going to tell it again because surely everybody didn't hear it. At the other church... When Centra was a lot younger, there was a very capable police officer who started attending our church. He could sing. He could witness. He was, he was quite a fella. And he came to talk to me one day and he said, Pastor, I witnessed to no less than a dozen criminals every day. I put them in the back of my car. They're in cuffs. They cannot get out. And I tell them about Jesus. He said, but I want you to help me with something. I want to get in the ministry. So I'm going to quit my job and I want a church to pastor so I can be in the ministry. And I said, are you kidding me? You will witness to more people in a week than you'll probably win to Jesus in a year. What is wrong? And see, and that's what I have to deal with a lot. People saying, I want to be in the ministry. What they mean is, I want to stand behind a pulpit and preach. Folks, this is not glamorous stuff. This is the, this is the cute part of it right here. No. Ministry is living out there. Living with them and letting your light shine in front of them. Ministry is walking it out, fleshing it out. <clears throat> Ministry is saying, my life's all to pieces too. But thank God, Jesus is going to take care of me. It may be this way now. But it won't always be this way because God is going to take care of me. And then I hear people say often, well, I'm going to quit my job anyway, Pastor, because most of the time people don't listen to you. Have you noticed that? <laughs> Their minds are already made up. I just let them talk and then I say, whatever, you know, I'll be praying for you. Yeah, all right. <laughs> but, but, but when they say this, but Pastor, God will provide. Okay, that's great. And then they start a journey of their own making. And I want to say to you this morning, if you're one of those people, hear me well. God never finances foolishness. <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> and once a person says, God told me, I'm done. There's no advice to be given. They don't need consultation. They don't need revelation. 
God told me. They don't even need my opinion anymore. God told me to do this. God bless you. Go do it. But then I hear, can I get some money from the church to do it? God told me to start a church, Pastor. Great. But I need for the church to support me. Really? God told me to start a church, plant a church. And I'm going to send out 500 letters and ask people to financially contribute to this. Are you kidding me? See, I don't think that way. I guess I thought I'd never say it this way. I'm from the old school. If God told you to do it, God will help you do it. And you don't need to go around with your hat in your hands saying, help me do what God has called me to do. When Sandra and I, here we go, when Sandra and I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina to begin in this church, we could not buy groceries. We could not pay bills. The money was so little that she cried about as much as she cries now. <laughs> we had a new baby. We had to, and how long did we pay for Anna, Sandra? Years? That's when the hospital would let you make payments on your baby. Well, we made payments on the baby. Then we went by faith and bought a dresser for the baby's clothes and paid on that for two years, three years, something like that. It was terrible. If it hadn't been for our parents, we wouldn't have eaten. I'm just going to tell you how it is. Happy New Year. <laughs> I remember one time we had struggled so long, and I'm not kidding you, but we never asked anybody for a dime. I never asked for personal help. I said, God called me here, and God will take care of me. And I remember one time after three years, the men of the church got together and decided to give me a raise and pay our utilities and half of our social security. They uh, announced that to me on a Sunday night. And uh, Sandra had already gone home with the kids. And I went home and told her, and you talk about Shouting, Lord have mercy. If we'd been drinkers, we'd have been slop dead drunk that night. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> we can go to Dairy Queen. <laughs> it was the most wonderful, euphoric feeling we had ever had. And three days later, on Wednesday night, after church, they called another meeting and took it all back. <laughs> True. Took every penny of it back because one of the men said, I don't know. He wasn't in the first meeting. He got a little skittish. He said, I don't know about this. They took it all back. I had a choice to make. I could be bitter. I could stomp my foot and say, I don't need you. I could go around asking people for financial help. It's tough to watch your wife cry. Or I could say, God called me here. And when God calls you, God will take care of you. I never asked for help. We stayed. They're gone. Life is good. God is faithful. And I'm telling you today, if God is in it, God will take care of you. I uh, want you to understand something. Life is not about being happy. It's not about having fun. It's not about getting the perfect job. There are too many people today, and I don't know what it is. It's, it's a younger generation. They'll just quit a job. 
I don't like this job. I quit. And go home to mama and daddy. I don't get that. Uh, well, I don't like it. I'm not fulfilled. This is not what I've called to do. I didn't train to do this. I wasn't educated to do this. I quit. You can't do that. But that's the mentality of this world, and it's ruining this country. Go to work. You can't have the perfect job. You can't make the money you want to make it first. You can't keep up with your friends and their cars. You don't need to be in debt. Debt will kill you spiritually. Debt will choke the life out of you. Get out of debt. Don't get in debt. It doesn't matter what people think about your success. You don't have to prove anything to anybody. Have some dollars in your pocket. Don't give it away to the bank all the time. And quit this American dream stuff. Quit dreaming. Not going over very well, is it? God puts you in jobs you don't like. God places you in situations that are not fun. God will even plant you in a neighborhood you don't belong in. God will even put you in a church you're not comfortable in. And he does it to teach faithfulness. You see, in the mundane and the boring and the frustrating and the unfulfilling, God teaches you patience. God puts you in places to show you that ministry is not glorious and Christianity is not glamorous. The greatest ministry you will ever do, you will do in a hidden place where nobody knows it. In uneventful circumstances with people nobody else knows about or cares about. That's the greatest ministry of all. The greatest ministry you can do for God is take care of your family. So, fellas, after work, go home. Don't go have a drink with the guys till the wife gets the kids in bed. Pastor, are you actually saying that to church people? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think in 2014, we ought to work on our walk. Our everyday down-to-earth walk. Work it out. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Stop being super spiritual. Stop fluttering around in another dimension. That's not the faith. The faith of Abraham is to obey God when you don't know what to do. The faith of God is to be somewhere you don't want to be, knowing that he put you there. Because he trusts you there. And we spend our whole lives trying to get out of this job, out of this place, out of this situation. We're we're, uh, harrowed about it. We're uh, frustrated with it. And God says, I put you there. I didn't put you there for you to be happy. I put you there because you're in my army. You're my soldier and I gave you a command. You have a mission, now carry it out. So I'm going to say it again. Quit the dreaming business. Dream the impossible dream. To dream (laughs) the impossible dream. (laughs) Climb every mountain. (laughs) Ford every stream. (laughs) Follow every rainbow. Till you find your dream. Oh, I could go on and on and on. (laughs) 
But what are you looking for? Take the skin off. Here's what you'll find that you're looking for. More money. So you can buy more things. You're looking for comfort. So you won't be uncomfortable. That's the dream. And that's the dream that's destroying this country. That's the dream that's infecting the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm standing here today as a pastor that loves your soul. And I'm telling you, if you want to know Jesus deeply and fully and you want to walk by faith, if you want to walk in the Spirit, if you want to live in the Word, come down where we live and walk it out every day. When somebody slaps your face, turn the other cheek. When somebody steals your cloak, give him your coat also. When someone falsely accuses you, don't curse them. Bless them in the name of Jesus. When you feel like everybody's turned against you, remember that God will stand with you. That's walking it out, ladies and gentlemen. I just have a, a, a sense that a real and great faith is not taking a step and hoping it's right. Real faith is believing your steps are designed by God. It's not, I know I shouldn't, but I, I do repeat. You shouldn't say, oh, I hope this is right, God. No, you should say, I'm where God has designed me to be. Therefore, I will rejoice, I will bless, I will serve. If there's no grapes on the vine, if the barn is empty, if there's no cattle in the stall, yet I will praise him. I will glorify the God of my salvation. So here's my New Year's conclusion. Number one, accept your circumstances. It's the way it is, but it's not the way it's always going to be, so accept it. Don't deny it. Don't curse it. Don't run from it. Accept it. Just accept. You know, it took me years to come to this place. I accept who I am. I accept that I am a, a, a fickle person. I accept that I don't always have pure thoughts. I accept that I don't always do the right thing. I accept that my motives are not always pure. I accept that. I accept the fact that I'm not complete yet. I'm not practically perfect yet. I'm not who I want to be. I accept all that. I accept the fact that some days I'm up and some days I'm down. I don't fight this anymore. I don't fight to stay up. I just ride the waves. I'm tired of trying to stay on top of the wave. I just decided at times just fall off the board and the wave will take me in. Just accept your circumstances. But I don't like them. Okay. Who in the Bible did? I don't want them. Who in the Bible did? Even Jesus said, God, is it possible for this thing to be taken away from me? But I don't want to talk about it. All I know is this. And that's what I'm going to have. And I have it on my refrigerator. And I quote it every day. And I see a picture every day. And I put that car on my refrigerator. And I walk by and put my hand on it. And that's the car I'm going to have. Well, go get it. And then pay for it. In about six weeks. Let's see if it smells as good as it used to. And see if you like making $850 payments on something that's already broken down somewhere. Just accept your circumstances. You know it's okay to drive a, an old car. Y'all understand that? You young couples, you don't have to have a Land Rover. You don't have to move into a fine home and live under that debt every day. At some point, just realize that contentment is a rich thing in your life. Godliness. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Paul said there are plenty of people who've gone after riches and they've made shipwreck of their faith. You can't go after riches 
and not have a tragedy in your life. Oh, what happened? Hello? You cannot go after riches and not have tragedy in your life because of those riches. So the greatest place you can come, I believe, in my opinion, you say, but aren't you, aren't you under the anointing? I don't know. I'm not one of those that goes around, my God, I feel something. <laughs> I feel the Holy Ghost welling up in my spirit, man. Not really. I'm looking forward to watching the Packers game tonight. <laughs> but I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. Nothing can change it. God knows who I am. God knew who I was before he made me. He knows what I like and what I don't like. He knows I like to shoot guns. He knows I like all kinds of crazy things. But he loves me anyway and lets me do that anyway. And he's going to take me to heaven anyway. Number two. What was the first one? Accept your circumstances. Thank you, Sean. Even though that's not what you said. <laughs> Number two, quit dreaming. Wake up. Wake up to reality and responsibility. Get a job. Or two. What's wrong with having two jobs? There are people sitting around, I can't find a job. Every, almost every place you go today has a sign on the door looking for some kind of help. I ain't doing that. Okay. Then you can't be helped. You are unadvisable. You are unteachable. Because if you're sincere about feeding your family, paying bills, working for God, you'll work. You won't depend on the government to send you a check every month. It's about to run out of money, by the way. So quit dreaming and go to work and get a job. Number three, stop blaming others and stop depending on others. Well, I'm in this situation because they did this to me or that happened to me. Okay, it happened. Okay. Move on. Can't change it. You can't sit down. Quit, you got to move on in life or you'll get run over. Am I telling the truth? Why are we always blaming somebody else for our own incompetence and laziness and inability to figure out what we want to do in life? It's their fault. No, it's not their fault. It's your fault that you won't take advantage of the Spirit of God that's inside of you and can rise above it. And at some point, let me you know one. I remember the day that Sandra and I got married. Dennis may remember this. He was in the back room. Uh, my dad was straightening up my tie. And I'd never heard my dad say anything like this, especially to me. He's straightening up my tie and he's right there. He said, Now listen, if this doesn't work out, you're not coming home. And I can't tell you how I, he meant it. <laughs> Thank God it worked out. <laughs> but he meant it. You're not coming home. You see, we get the idea that if this doesn't work out, we'll let somebody else bail us out. And it just doesn't work out that way. Number four. Be faithful in little things. Did you know God cares more about how you handle a dime than how you handle a hundred dollars? Ooh, you want to think about that one, don't you? Because if you're faithful in little things, you will be faithful in big things. If you want to get God's attention, just be faithful in something that nobody else cares about. Do it as unto Christ. Do it because God is looking. Not because man can give you a reward, but because one day God will give you a reward. And the next one, 
Let God open the doors and you quit trying to kick them in. Let God open the door. And I finish with this. The world is not listening to us. They've already heard all of the prattle, the emptiness, the silly language, the false motivation. They've seen all the hypocrisy. They're not listening to preachers anymore on TV. It's just Christians that listen to them. Ouch. Ouch. Sinners aren't listening to Christian television. There's something much more important to them. Again, it's us Christians who watch Christian television. Ah, ooh. No, the world doesn't care one thing about what we're saying. But they are watching us as we take step by step every day of our life through death, through birth, through tragedy, through sickness, um, through heartache, through financial breakdown, nervous breakdown. They're watching how we react to this. And that's why that verse, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, don't do it because I'm here, but in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Keep going. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked, anybody agree with that? And perverse, anybody agree with that? Generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Stand with me please. I want to walk in obedience and truth. I want to be real. On the way out, if somebody asks, oh, you know, what, what did Pastor preach on today? Just say, he's keeping it real. <laughs> keep it real. I hear that all the time. Keeping it real. It's time to keep it real. It's time to get real. It's time to stop faking it. When somebody says to you, they say, I have cancer, don't you dare say, we don't receive that in the name of Jesus. You're healed by God's grace. You say, we're going to walk through this together. God is able to heal. God is able to do anything. Let's ask him to heal you. But until he does, we're going to walk together hand in hand, and I'm going to hold you up. And if he doesn't, I'm going to stand by you, and we're going to serve God together. That's keeping it real. She got healed of cancer. But I also buried some people this year with cancer. Your wife passed away just days ago. God did not heal her. She's in heaven. He doesn't heal everybody. We don't get what we want in life all the time. But we have all we need. And Jesus said he would supply our every need. He would be to us everything we need. I promise you, God be my witness and help. I'm not going to try to cover up the truth or fake it. I'm just going to tell you how it is. God's able to do anything, but he might not do it. It's according to his own good discretion and pleasure. And whatever he does is right and good and holy, and he is to be praised for all that he does. Can I get an amen from anybody? All this year, 2013, my heart has been broken. I have sunk. I have buried friends. It's been, it's been one of those years. I've buried people in this church that I sat and ate with time and time and time again. 
friends at meals, friends on trips, friends on vacations, and I had to bury them. That's after we asked God to heal them. Does that discourage me? No, sir. God does everything after the counsel of his own will. And I may not know why till I get there. But I'll tell you what God wants from us today. Whether or not it looks good, rejoice. Whether or not it comes to pass, rejoice. God is faithful. Can anybody praise him for his faithfulness? Sing it, David. Listen to this. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my name. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. And I, I'm desperate for you. Now, Father, as we begin this journey called a new year, we ask that you help us. Lord, we need help. We're not capable of doing the right thing without help. We ask you to help us to humble ourselves in your sight and recognize our dire need for you every day. Lord, help us to come to grips with reality and responsibility so that when we walk out into that world, we will be shining lights in a dark place and people will see God at work inside of us. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, amen. See you this weekend, God willing. And I